Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Steve Torso. I'm the Managing Director for Wholesale Investor. Firstly, I'd like to say uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming today. You know, it's really, like, to host something like this, you know, to, for us six months ago, this idea of ho hosting a, a crypto and blockchain convention just wasn't even on the radar, wasn't on the agenda, and wasn't something that we were contemplating about. And for me as a, a, as a founder, and I can appreciate the investors that work with founders and also founders that could be here as well, you know, it, it's interesting for us to see the rate of growth in this as an area. And yes, there, there's part hype to it, you know, there, there's obviously hype to it, but also there's a fundamental underlying change that we're also seeing take place in our area. So to kick off my, to kick off my presentation, I, I basically want you to, uh, uh, to understand why we're doing this. I want to give a bit of an in indication as to what our journey, uh, fr from a wholesale investor perspective and my personal journey with is, is in this area. You know, for us, one of our, one of our shareholders um, is Dominic Carosa, who owns bitcoin.com.au. And last year, we actually did a promotion uh, for bitcoin.com.au. And it was actually one of the most, as far as opportunities go, it was the one of the most uh, high, by the way, it seems like it's pretty hot in the room. If we can get the air conditioning a bit cooler, that'd be great. Um, yeah, the, the response from our investor audience was unbelievable. And the company raised a decent amount of money from, from that promotion. And I thought, geez, that's really interesting. Then we worked with uh, Peak Asset Management on the Timeless offer. And following the, following the interest of Timeless time offer, to give you an idea, it had, from our registrations, it had 280 registrations of interest. The company was only raising two and a half million. They had 10 million of offers. And this was for a pre-IPO blockchain company coming out of the UK. And I thought, wow, you know, I've never seen that sort of interest uh, in, in a company before. So that really got my attention. And then sort of late September, uh, we come across PowerLedger. And it's probably one of the most known stories uh, in this area about what's happened to Power Ledger since they actually went through their ICO. But we had one day to promote them just because of the time in which we come across them. We thought, you know what? If we want to see what sort of interest is from our in investor database in, in this area, this is probably a good case. They'd or at that stage, they'd already raised 15 million. You know, they already had a significant amount of money raised. So we thought, okay, let's, let's, promote, let's promote it and see. So we sent out an email and the registrations went through the roof. The website, you know, the, the stats on the website for their page also went ballistic. And then the next thing we hear, you know, and said, they obviously did a lot of promotion. It was a very successful offer. And I think they ended up raising like 34 million or something, you know, some, some crazy amount like that. But then obviously it was at the time that Bitcoin was going up and Ethereum was going up. So the price just skyrocketed to the point where it was at, I think it was at 20 times or something at one stage. But what really interested me is this. So just after that period, so October, we started coming across uh, some more crypto deals. And then November, I did a road, we did a, the Wholesale Investor did a roadshow throughout Asia, and we did Singapore, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Now, if anyone knows those markets, literally every single conversation was either crypto or blockchain. Ooh, that was a good catch while I was talking. <laughs> crypto, crypto or blockchain related, right? So it, that, that really started to open my mind because, you know, obviously we do a lot in Asia, and that's what our Asian audience were, were really interested in. And I had sovereign funds coming up to me, talking to me about this area, setting up meetings for me. One of them was we spent three, three and a half hours on a Sunday with these two investors that had actually made retirement level money, you know, at that time that were previously investment managers for a family office and for a sovereign fund. So I thought this is really interesting. Are you dinging me? <laughs> How funny. Uh, yeah, he's, he's kicking me off already. Um, you know, so, I, you know, so to me, I, there's something, as a founder, I could not ignore that. And then whilst I was in that meeting, I sent a message to one of my close friends. And the message I asked him was this, have you participated in an ICO? And he wrote back an answer which blew me away and changed my whole reference. And he wrote, I've been in and out of five ICOs in the last week. Right, so my question for you guys is really simple. Who here has invested into crypto in any way, shape or form, out of curiosity? That is astonishing. Who here has been to a wholesale investor event before, out of curiosity? Actually, less for that. How funny is that? So this, to give you an idea how much this market has changed, you just wouldn't expect that. And then we went to, we had a fund manager event taking place. So after the Asia trip, I was like, okay, I've got to look into this more. I started speaking to some investors at our, we had a fund manager event and one of the most popular deals at that fund is actually presenting today was Apollo. So I was asking people that were going up and chatting to Apollo, you know, at the time, why were they interested? And the driving force seemed to be one thing that was quite, fun. obviously it was getting a lot of hype, but they all, but a lot of people, and I'm gonna ask this question to everybody, 
who has family members, aka kids, that are currently trading crypto or interested in crypto? Right? That is the, that was the number one thing. And I found that that was what was probably driving the interest in this area was actually from family members. And I thought, is this a changing of a generation? <laughs> so, you know, I said, as a founder, we've been doing this for nine, ten years, right? I plan to keep, you know, I said, I, we love what we do and we love to keep on moving with what's interesting. And so I thought, that's, that's really interesting. I've never seen that before. We've seen so many trends and themes and so forth. But as far as an underlying shift, we found that quite interesting. So... You know, I, I, as far as in my, I, in doing this, if you came to our emergence conference, when we hosted our emergence conference, we only had this half of the room, right? And there was people actually standing, it was like five meters back trying to get into the room for the crypto and blockchain session. So I said, if anything doesn't wake you up to think how much interest is in this area, and even right now, like the price of Bitcoin is what, 60, 70% off? And, and yet, Look at the interest in this room today, right? And I said, we've got, we've got 700 registrations for today, right? So anywhere between 300 to 500 people are going to come to this event today. We have never had that for an individual showcase that we have done before. We had it for emergence, but not for an individual showcase. So if you want to understand why all of a sudden we're looking at this area, why you're seeing opportunities from us uh, in this area, this is why. And it's effectively because of you guys. If you guys weren't here, if you guys weren't click, clicking receive, you know, request, you know, receive interest or anything like that, we wouldn't be doing this, right? It's basically from the demand of our audience where this interest is generated. Now, just a quick procedural thing for today. I'm going to let Alex manage most of the part, but we have set up different areas. All the companies that are presenting today, we've obviously got 10 guest speakers. We've had, you know, we've had guys that have flown in from the US. So Bob Bonomo will be talking about what Wall Street thinks about this area. He, you know, he's coming from the US to, be, to participate in this event. Um, we've got, from Hong Kong, we've got Dave Chapman, who's flown in specifically for this event. So if you ever found yourself stuck with 30 million, worth, 30 million plus worth of crypto and thinking about how to change that into fiat, Dave is your man, right? And he's been involved in this area since 2012, right? So one of the bigger exchanges out of Hong Kong. Fascinating guy. I said the panel sessions are perfectly stacked for you to get as much information as possible, but I absolutely know that at the end of today you're going to have more questions than you have answers because that to me is just the world of crypto. So look, you know, really simple things, you know, as, as a bare basics, I know I've talked for a little bit too long, um, but basically 10 minutes for each company. At one minute we're, we're going to be dinging the companies to let them know that time's going to be completed. I said we've got a great lineup of speakers, guest speakers, companies, you know, the companies that are presenting are just as fascinating, right? And you see areas from gaming to, you know, life science to tech to, you know, I said it covers all spectrums. And I said, what you're seeing today is exactly what we're seeing, right? Which is hence why I said we find so much interest in this area. I said, take a look around, have a look at the people that, you know, you're chatting with. You know, it said it, it's something that we've never seen before in such a short period of time. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Alex to come and be your host. Thank you everybody for coming along. And, uh, Enjoy the day. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Wholesale Investors Crypto and Blockchain Convention. Now, just to give you a, a brief overview, the event schedule for today, we'll start with Nick Giretto from the Australian Digital Commerce Association, talking about ICOs, frameworks, and best practice. We then have four opportunities for you, Solara, PlayUp, Lust, and Livin. At the conclusion of those presentations, we'll be having some first networking and coffee, and we'll then resume after the break. Now, I would encourage you to visit the presenting companies at their stands, both in the room directly outside the doors, and in the main area. 10.45 to 11.30, we will have a panel discussion led by Jamie Skeller from Horizon State, who some of you may have seen present last year. That panel will feature a number of notables, including Dave Chapman, Alex Saunders, and several gentlemen from Blockchain Global. At 11.30, we'll also have Apollo Capital, Charitex and London Football Exchange presenting their ICOs and funds. That'll be followed by lunch. At 12.50, we will have Bob Bonomo talking about the state of cryptocurrency in the United States. That'll be followed by Odd Up, Blockchain Terminal 
and forever has fallen. We will then have at 2.30 a blockchain specific panel discussion on industry specific use cases. That'll be led by Darren Younger from Lakiba. We will then have presentations from Ned's Coin, Zucaz, Antihero Capital and Saw Earth, followed by a break and then crypto asset valuations from Henrik Anderson, who you will know from Apollo Capital. And then finally some networking. As Steve said, each company will be given 10 minutes to present. There will be a warning bell at nine and 10 minutes. And if you're interested in the opportunity, you can request the offer via the link that was sent to you via SMS or email this morning. You can come see them at the, their booth or you can use the, the sheets that are on their tables or exchange business cards. You can also come and ask myself or any of our colleagues. We have a number of upcoming events. Again, feel free to reach out to myself, Steve, and any of our colleagues to find out more information. But we do have a crypto-specific event in Melbourne on the 16th of April and a small cap showcase at Investec on the 13th. This event, of course, would not be possible without our supporters, Investec, PwC, BMYG, and of course, DLA Piper. I would now like to welcome Nick Durepo, the CEO and Managing Director of the Australian Digital Commerce Association. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Steve, for the opportunity to come along today. Um, there's an amazing lineup of speakers, and I guess that's why my topic, regulation, has been put right at the front, because I want to get rid of sort of the the painful medicine, I guess, out of the way first, I'm not sure. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just give you a roundup of the overall regulatory picture in Australia as far as crypto and ICO is concerned, um, where we've got to, what we still need to do. And the interesting thing to start with, I guess, is uh, as an Australian, when you have the opportunity to travel around the world, uh, you get very, or you get often uh, swamped almost by people who come to you saying Australia's got this great reputation in what we're doing in crypto. Um, I was in Vietnam a couple of weeks ago for Vietnam Blockchain Week and literally had 50 people lined up wanting to understand how to launch an ICO in Australia. Uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, famously have got some issues going on with how they're, uh, you know, tackling ICO regulation and are also really interested in, in how to make the most of Australia's regulatory environment. So from the outside, we can sort of pat ourselves on the back and, and say, yep, we're doing pretty well. When you're inside, you realise that, yeah, we're doing okay, but maybe there's some more work to do. And that's, I guess, the, the, the line I'm going to try to share with you today. So I guess, first of all, just quickly, who is ADCA? ADCA, the Australian Digital Commerce Association. Uh, is the industry association for Australian businesses that are investing in or at least investigating blockchain technology. Um, I took over as CEO just about two years ago. At that time, there were 19 members. Yesterday, we signed up our 85th. So the, it's, a, it's another indication sort of along the lines of the stats Steve was quoting before, just how exciting and how fast this space is growing. And, you know, our role is very much to... Uh, act as the, the common voice, I guess, to the extent that we can do that uh, for this sector, particularly in engaging with uh, politicians and with government. And part of the insight that I'm able to offer today is because we have had some pretty good conversations with a lot of the regulators uh, over the last few years. Um, and w why are we doing that? Uh, so our, our mission is to encourage the responsible adoption of blockchain technology in Australia. If you break that down, there's two parts of that sentence. One is encouraging the adoption of blockchain technology. Um, I am, and I think most people in this room uh, would probably share their view, I'm utterly convinced that being a leader in the deployment of blockchain technology will be as important to the future economic history of this country as being a leader in the deployment of electricity networks or national highway networks or telecommunications networks was for countries in the 20th century. It is an international economic and commercial race. There are 20 or so countries that are gonna lead that and everybody else will be left behind and it will be very hard to catch up. Um, so there is a window of opportunity that we need to jump on. 
and we are actually positioned quite well uh, in that. Although, I guess what I would say about Australia in that respect is, uh, if, you, if you use a, a cycle race, I guess, as a metaphor, we are in that leading pack, but largely because of the indi individual efforts of some great athletes, if you want to call it that, what we're not yet doing as a country is that teamwork where we slipstream one another and sort of push forward to the front. Uh, and that's probably the stage we need to aim for. The other, the other part of our mission statement, though, is responsible. And these, do, these two tie together. Right? Um, and it's all about how you make sure that the deployment of this technology is done in a way that's going to actually encourage all of the right behaviours that you want, is going to protect consumers, is going to safeguard markets. And that's important in its own right, but it's also important for the adoption of the technology. Right? And, and we have to acknowledge the truth that unfortunately there are some players that have done the wrong thing and they've hurt the industry as a whole. And a lot of our job is to actually say, well, how do we make it harder and harder for them to get any oxygen while those genuine innovators with amazing ideas have a better opportunity to, to get move forward? So that's the line that we're trying to walk. So the interesting thing about Agca, and it ties to the theme of, of our presentation today, um, you know, the first piece of regulation I want to talk about is the GST rules. And ADCA was actually created nearly five years ago uh, because of a misstep by the ATO. So five years ago, the ATO uh, put out a ruling around the use of a digital currency to make a payment. And they said that um, uh, if you make a payment using a digital currency, you would pay GST on the underlying transaction as you should. But you would also pay GST on the exchange of the coin or the token. Because in their mind, it was not money, and money is uh, exempted under the GST, so a supply of money doesn't attract GST, but the exchange of an asset does. And therefore, you would pay GST twice. And that immediately led to two of, the, two of the Australian crypto exchanges basically saying, see you later, Mr. Morrison, we'll send you a postcard from London. Right? And that's what they've done. They're based in London now. Right? Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying that it was Scott Morrison himself who made that decision. It was a lot lower down because in those days it was you know, far less important. And actually, from a legal, technical tax point of view, it was a perfectly correct decision. Right? It just had this unintended consequence of squashing innovation. So ADCA actually came about uh, with, the, with the, the remaining digital currency exchanges in Australia got together and said, we want to change that. And as I guess many people in this room might know, uh, that five-year-long journey actually came to an end just in November. So I think it was August or something like that, the legislation changed with retrospective effect where that problem, that double taxation problem, has now been removed. The Treasury couldn't quite bring itself to say that a digital currency is money for GST purposes, so they didn't change the GST laws that far. What they did do was introduce a definition of digital currencies and in all of the relevant parts of the Act have now said the supply of money or a digital currency. Right? So it's, it's a, from a legislative drafting point of view, what they would regard as an elegant way to solve the problem without quite saying actually this might be money because that's probably a little bit big for them. Um, interestingly and importantly, the way they defined uh, digital currencies, uh, it does require that it be available for, um, uh, like generally available uh, as a payments platform. So most ICOs, do not fall within that definition, which is quite important. Most, to most OCO tokens don't. So GST was sort of the first part of the journey. We made a mistake, but we got back on track. What about money laundering, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing laws? So just last week, we saw the culmination of a big effort there. And on the 3rd of April, uh, changes that were made last year to Australia's anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing rules went into effect. And as of that date, um, a digital currency exchange operating in Australia must be registered with Austrac. It must perform KYC checks. Uh, it has to have a whole AML program, including due diligence and training and responsible officers and all of that sort of stuff. And there are some reporting obligations uh, imposed upon the exchanges. Now, quite importantly, this means Australia is one of a half dozen countries in the world now that's got a really clear uh, AML framework around digital currencies. So it's an important step forward. Um, I like to think that ADCA uh, has actually helped a lot in the development of that. In fact, I know we did. Um, we actually launched more than 18 months ago the Australian Digital Currency Industry Code of Conduct. 
So well before there was any legislative requirement, ADCA members were already uh, doing KYC checks and having AML policies and so forth. So we not only anticipated the trend, but I actually like to think we helped work by working with the Attorney General's Department and with AUSJAC, actually help them understand the industry and get the framework right. And I think we've done a pretty good job as a country in getting that framework fairly right. So the AML piece is mostly done, although I'm going to come back to what I would regard as a big gap in a moment. And that gap really is consumer protection. So what's the consumer protection picture around cryptos and, and tokens? Well, the first problem is that ASIC uh, doesn't consider a digital currency to be a financial product. And so they, so they don't, or maybe even can't, depending on your reading of the legislation that governs ASIC, they can't uh, regulate the sector from a, from a consumer protection point of view. So what that means is that uh, general uh, principles of law, deceptive and misleading conduct, certainly do apply, but there are no specific consumer protection uh, uh, provisions that apply yet in this space. Uh, the ADCA Code of Conduct, for example, uh, anticipates what we think is necessary and includes things like uh, the requirement to hold customers' funds in a trust account, no trading on your own account with the customer's money, data security standards, transparent pricing, dispute resolution scheme, and more. The sort of things that you would look for in a mature business that's actually taking its responsibilities to deal with its customers uh, fairly uh, and, and taking those responsibilities uh, seriously. Now, the interesting thing here is that I think that uh, there is a need to move beyond self-regulation in this space. And there's an opportunity to actually kill two birds with one stone. So there is one big gap in the AML rules that, that, uh, that Austrac put out there, which is they only apply to a digital currency exchange that's domiciled in Australia. And there's absolutely nothing to stop an Australian from investing in digital currency using the exchange based offshore. Okay. Now, just to put that in perspective, uh, Adka did some work with Accenture just recently and uh, we came up with, so we got the Australian exchanges to share their transactional data uh, on a confidential basis with Accenture, who then produced a report that has the aggregate and average data and so forth, right? So without disclosing any one individual's, uh, one business's details, able to get some big numbers. Uh, what, that's, what that showed was that the seven ADCA exchanges uh, that were involved in that did almost $4 billion worth of transactions last year. If we gross that up by what we think might be uh, the representative market share, it probably means around about six billion was done with Australian domiciled exchanges. What we don't know is what was done offshore. Now, here's my point. If we get a stronger consumer protection uh, arrangement in place, then you can create a virtuous circle where there's an incentive for more Australians to make sure that they are doing business with Australian domiciled exchanges. Right? This is a good thing because one, it brings them the protections, but two, it means that those Australian businesses get to grow and three, uh, they, become, they come within the AML CTF framework that Austrac applies. So let's make it easier for someone to make a choice between doing business with an Australian based exchange and one based in somewhere in Central Asia. If you choose to do that, buyer beware, take the risk, but you know, uh, better to do, one, to do business with one in Australia where there's a, a more robust protection framework. So that I think is, is an important step that we need to take. Uh, either ASIC needs to uh, adopt its views or amend its views and step in with some form of an AFSL or something like that, or maybe the ACCC needs to step up and look at this as, as a specific area. And with $6 billion flowing through the sector, I would argue that the regulator actually has a responsibility to do so. So what about ICOs or tokens? Well. Uh, ASIC late, late last year put out uh, an information sheet, 225, and it basically says, if you launch a token that looks like an existing financial product, we will regulate it as an existing financial product, which is a pretty logical uh, perspective. And it is actually uh, what underpins the fact that there is so much energy going on in Australia, because there is a pathway for legitimate businesses with exciting ideas to get an ICO floated um, uh, without uh, regulatory headaches, right? And that's great. Um, you know, many countries have not got even that level of clarity, right? There's a, a number of countries that have gone down the, 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 the ICO banning path, 
I was in Shanghai last year on the day that they announced uh, the ban in China on ICOs. I was due to give a speech at a, at a big blockchain conference and I literally had the commercial attaché at the Australian Embassy come up to me and say, don't talk about tokens if you want to leave China because you might spend more time here than you plan to. <laughs> uh, so, so that was some good advice. Um, but basically, if, if your token looks like a managed investment scheme, an offer of shares or a derivative, it will be regulated as such. Right? If it doesn't, then you can legally deploy a, an ICO subject to uh, the standard consumer protection laws uh, that we talked about before, deceptive and misleading conduct being the, the test that you can't cross. So that's good, but it's not quite enough. So as good as I think it is from an international perspective, uh, I think that from, from a how, do, how do we move further in Australia, well, it's not quite certain enough. So there is still enough wiggle room and ambiguity in those definitions. A lot of what ASIC said is that may uh, you know, fall within their regulation. Uh, so from a business point of view, we want to narrow that so that there's less may and it either is or isn't. Right? Is it much easier, less lawyers fees? Uh, it leaves most other forms of ICO subject only to general consumer law. And although that's good, it's probably not enough. Um, and it does importantly miss the opportunity to, to allow us to evolve fused financial products where we take the best of existing financial products and this amazing new thinking around different ways to, to raise money and so forth and put them together and change the markets completely so that tokens don't become this thing on the side. They actually become the way we do business. Right? And that's the transformation that will really change the world. And, and this gradualist approach by ASIC is not going to get us there. Right? So I'm giving them a lot of kudos for what they've done, but there is need to go further. Um, I think the, the, the couple of key next steps, uh, one is uh, let's get some real clarity. And I think the Swiss have led some good thinking on this. Let's get some real clarity around the different ICO types or token types you know, a payment, a payment token, a utility token, a security token. It seems like a good framework. If you think about what they do, they bring different regulatory challenges and that's sort of logical. You need to think about what the regulatory outcome for different types of tokens should be. Of course, the slightly complex part is that many tokens actually have attributes that fit into all of those buckets. So we need to think that through. And that's possibly why tokens actually need to be thought of as an emerging new asset class in their, in, in their own right and need a, a fresh look. <coughs> Which is why one of the things that ADCA is doing this year is working now on a self-regulatory code of conduct. So just as we did for the, the cryptocurrency space, our aim is by the middle of this year or probably the late middle of the second half of this year to put in place a self-regulatory code of conduct that sort of sets the trends for what we think the regulator should end up doing uh, as, they, as they evolve their thinking as well. The last topic uh, regula on regulation, tax. Uh, it's the least fun bit of regulation, but it's sort of important. Um, so we sort of talked about the GST piece. Uh, the GST issue is basically done and dusted now. I don't think there's much need to, to make uh, more moves there. But income and capital gains tax uh, most certainly are issues that need to be thought about. Um, you know, when, when we publish a number like there was $6 billion worth of transactions in crypto alone, that's not tokens, that's just cryptocurrencies, uh, you can bet that the ATO uh, notices that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at some of their recent statements, yes, they have noticed and they've formed some working groups and whatever, so, so they're interested in, in the whole tax issue. It's pretty clear from general taxation law principles, and I'm not a tax lawyer, so... I'm sort of relaying what I'm told by the people who have spent their whole life looking at the minutiae of this, but it's pretty clear that uh, depending on exactly how uh, the transaction works, it is either a taxable income or taxable gain if you make some money uh, uh, you know, on the sale or the purchase and sale of tokens. Right? Um, what we still don't have is real certainty of exactly where that applies, exactly what the mechanism is and so forth. So again, from a business investment point of view, certainty is important. So it's, it, we need to drive to that, that level of clarity. Uh, it is very clear that there will be reporting obligations imposed upon exchanges and those who are uh, um, promoting token sales to make sure that the taxpayer actually remembers to declare the gains that they made. Um, so so you know, we'll see that. But the conversation that has to be had with Treasury is okay, by all means, bring this new space within 
the, the ambit of the tax laws. That's a legitimate public policy thing. But hey, what about the tax benefits that currently apply to other asset classes that don't yet apply to this asset class? Right? So treat it the same way, same principles, no special favours, but also no detriments to any other, uh, any other form of asset. So that's a conversation we need to have on the taxation front. So I guess just in wrapping up, uh, the big picture I'd like to, to leave in your mind is that Australia is currently a leading jurisdiction for both digital currencies and, and ICOs or token sales. We're one of a few places in the world that is making good progress uh, on, on bringing the sort of business clarity that we need uh, to, to allow this to really thrive. Um, but that's so far been the result of different regulators moving at different paces. So we saw the ATOs make a, a misstep, I guess, on tax. We saw Austrac move. The ACCC haven't done as much as they should. ASIC are doing okay. But the different regulators are currently within their existing sort of silos, making their own bit of progress, and they're not quite joined up, right? Um, but we are mostly getting it right, right? And with the, with the gap on consumer protection, we're, we're definitely heading in the right direction. But what I think uh, the step we need to look at to go further is actually to say, well, how do we get a joined up regulatory review? How do we create a system where the taxation implications, the securities law implications, the consumer market law implications, uh, the AML implications are all thought through so that you get joined up dots that lead to a different outcome where you can actually say to business, it's simple and easy to promote uh, a new investment in this space. You know exactly what the rules are and consumers are protected in the process. Right? And it is absolutely a prize that's worth winning. Right? There are some jurisdictions around the world that are starting to move on this. A lot of them are small island nations in odd bits of the world. And uh, you can make your own judgments as to whether that's really where you want to see uh, the, the focus of this type of activity going. Um, one of them is a small island nation, but going down what I think is the right path, which is Singapore, they're, they're probably the leader uh, in bringing real clarity. Uh, and make no mistake, the reason Singapore is on this is not the 6 million people who live in Singapore. It's the 600 million people who live in ASEAN, right? And the billion people who live in China, right? Or 1.3 billion people who live in China. That's the game that Singapore has got its eye on. And that's the game that Australia does actually have a real opportunity. And I still think we can go past Singapore on this and become the destination of choice to be the centre for this massive transformation that's going to take on our world. But it does require even better and more advanced thinking on regulation. So seven out of 10 for Australia, better than most countries in the world, but let's aim for a nine and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And now I'd like to welcome Leon Gerard Vandenberg, CTO of Solara, to the stage. Welcome, everyone. What a journey. Um, you've got to uh, now hear me talk about some of my journey. And I guess uh, thank you to wholesale investors, Steve and uh, Alex. For, uh, for the preview and Nick, Nick as well. So my, uh, my experience with digital currencies goes back to 1999. I created with an Adelaide team of cryptographers a US dollar smart card called Navy Cash. We deployed US dollars on a Navy ship and we took all the coins off the ship and <coughs> turned that into a, a virtual currency, all managed centrally. Digital currencies has been part of how, I guess, I, I look at systems and I'm a systems design engineer from Canada. Uh, I like to look at things uh, more holistically. And uh, certainly this journey with regulation and uh, the overstep and uh, being involved early in the space means you've got some battle scars. You've got to wear and wear them proudly. I was doing Bitcoin mining when uh, Dominic Caruso set up uh, the Bitcoin Capital Fund. It was a, a capital fund for $50 million. In Melbourne, we tried to do that. And then the GST uh, ruling came in, which meant that no 
no real uh, business could be set up here. Um, we also set up a, another couple of companies working with Dominic and uh, this journey of trying to make possible um, a digital currency that uh, had crypto features and uh, was uh, secure and also an ethical type of asset class. So this is what Solera is. Solera is a clean energy blockchain. We fractionalize solar energy off a solar panel. Now what is abundant in Australia is solar. Solar energy is a beautiful asset class. It's ethical. Uh, we need more of it and we need it at a str strategic price for communities. And so this is a win, win, win for people that can be solar punks. Solar punks is the coin that I would like to uh, phrase. Get it into your vernacular. This is our meme or our theme for our token sale. You can be part of this asset class. You can own a token that secures solar energy into your wallet. And this also is a signal to the man that uh, you're not really happy with the current power price. Solar punk really is uh, this vision for a positive sci-fi future, not the dystopia that you'll go to the theaters for. We have an abundance here. It's just not distributed equally. So what does Solera do? We put a smart card chip on a solar panel and we synthetically create blockchain math as the energy comes off the panel. Every panel makes a little heartbeat like an EKG of math. So we produce blockchain math by producing green energy. And that little um, bit of math and data set accumulates up into being a quant score for solar farms. It's a way to rate a solar farm just like you have a Moody's rating. It also allows us to give you ownership rights and we're in the rule of law of Australia. We've got the best property rights laws in the world. So a piece of virtual token can be your ownership of a solar farm. And this is really, really interesting when you start looking at crowdfunding and bootstrapping solar for solar communities. So what have we done? We've been working for 20 months. We'd like to uh, do two things now that the regulations have kind of caught up and we have a window to do two things. We're going to do equity and token at the same time. The equity play will be a crowdsource equity fund. We will do this with a partner we're in discussions with on market to allow Joe Public to own a piece of solar as an equity parcel. People that would like to be more exposed to the crypto side of the world can also um, participate in a private sale or a public sale for our token as well. So we're in the current round right now today for private discussions. Andrew Bald over there has the license. Put your hand up, Andrew. We're uh, taking private placements for equity in, a, in our company called Rights Fusion. We take property rights to do with fusion energy, the sun, and we turn that into a valuable asset class. We're also in the process of doing a token sale, and that token sale will be global. And this liquidity points will be staged to uh, give everyone a good story and a participation right according to the risk that they feel is that they're comfortable with. The market has had some problems. We've known about some of this uh, energy fraud or carbon credit fraud. There's a, actually a problem with smart meters in this, uh, this part of the, the world. You don't own the data that's on the smart meter. You don't get the proper price information or green signal information to understand what's on the grid, how you can use it, and what your own solar equipment is doing. There's also poor data quality. Because someone else owns the data, you don't get that data quality at a fidelity or a timing that is useful to make a pricing decision or a sales decision or a storage decision. And as well, it's uh, difficult to finance these projects. You've got to be really obnoxious or really determined to get a solar um, project up. So let's try and make this work. So this is a little bit of the technology under the hood. We produce a, a type of uh, zero knowledge uh, proof off the solar panel. The data stays on the solar panel or in the microgrid in your premises. We don't um, take advantage of your private information. We just provide a mathematical proof that that information is there. We create a, a type of market for that data set. The electrons that your solar farm makes has to be settled locally. I can't export electrons to Japan, but I can synthetically create a type of carbon credit off of the solar farm. And that solar farm can trade that credit globally. So here's a little bit of the tech under the hood. 
this is the stuff that I do at my engineering life, which is embedded systems, smart cards of making little things that do math very quickly. These uh, are about a buck now. Um, and per solar, per solar panel, that's a buck out of about a $250 cost per panel. Uh, for this infinitesimal amount of uh, uh, additional fixed capital, you get so much more utility. It's also been patented, and uh, we're working with the inventor. We have an exclusive right to this uh, patent, and th those rights will be rolling out globally. So we have a little bit of a competitive advantage and a moat to make this possible. There's uh, new ways to uh, manage all this data. Um, you know Android phones and the how much uh, memory and storage you have on a little Android phone. So a little industrial PC will be part of the inverter and the solar panel network that we put on the, uh, the home or the solar farm string of solar, solar panels. And we will provide that uh, service as an intermediary uh, function. You still own your data. We provide energy management and mediation and secure asset tracking. Again, from this uh, baseline of data, we can create synthetic ways to reward investors, produce carbon credits, and in a, a blockchain economy, provide new types of innovative ownership models with your ownership of your own project or a community project. So this is uh, notionally the, um, the sort of topology diagram, a community solar uh, project, like a little apartment block or tenancy, each become a participant in a node of peer-to-peer -peer connected blockchain services. This all happens under the hood. This isn't something that a consumer sees. What the consumer sees is basically a little home energy dashboard. So prosumers get to see the data from their PV panel, the battery, the inverter, and they get to decide what to do with home consumption. A solar farm gets a lot more detail, including what they would do with a battery bank, and then the smart city can start to orchestrate this. Um, this is the way that energy markets in Australia should move to a distributed edge logic, so there's no fragility with a command and control type system. It should be edge logic, so, so what? The CBD is down with power. They, um, there's been some uh, grid problem, but why is the suburb still dark? It's crazy. Um, we're working with um, very strong and um, very experienced partners called the Energy Web Foundation. Gavin Wood, who uh, co-wrote uh, the uh, Ethereum blockchain with uh, Vitalik, has really created the something called the Energy Web Client. It's based on parity. And under the hood, if you want to talk to me about that, um, we can go a little bit further. There's some advantages, and you're welcome to uh, read more detail with our white paper. And Alex is giving me a hurry up here. So we have to take a little strategic step. Uh, proof of installation, proof of existence is really this uh, sequence of how the chip on the panel works. Then we have this concept of proof of fusion. Instead of using proof of stake, our hy hypothesis and thesis is that with proof of fusion, we can stop the gaming and the, the fragility of proof of stake networks by having the data off the, off the network sensors as part of that, that solution. We then would be moving our solution to support community currencies and green assets. So we have a little token economy. Um, on the left side, we turn on the electron asset, and uh, that little system redeems a sole token for turning on the infrastructure, much like a smart card set-top box works. The smart card turns on the set-top box. And on the right, you have to put the sole token at risk or at stake to be involved with our data market. So I'm just going to say the tokenization is a real enabler. The sole token enables the infrastructure. And then you redeem your sole token for a project asset token, for a participation to be a solar punk. That solar park punk initiative allows you to then have a yield token. And that's the one that will be regulated. That's the one that would be registered. That's the one that the lawyers need to have a, a type of purview on. Again, the token sale is pretty typical, 10% for the team. There's uh, some very good uh, s s s services and advisors on our, on our mix, and the community also gets supported. And um, from there, there's a little bit of a competitive matrix. And uh, please, come and have a look at our stand. We're here all day. And I don't want to go over time. I respect the other participants today. Thank you. Thank you, Leon Gerard. And now I would like to welcome Ryan Bowman, CCO of PlayUp. 
the stage. How are you doing? Um, my name's Ryan Bowman. I'm actually the, the Chief Sales Officer, but it's interchangeable most days in this company. Daniel Simic, our CEO, normally does his presentation, so I apologise. He's been uh, called down to Melbourne, so you're uh, stuck with me. Uh, a bit about me. Um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. My previous startup was sold to PlayUp earlier this year, which is why I'm up here talking to you guys today. And the startup before that was um, listed on the stock exchange in 2011. So, um, been in tech and entrepreneurial activity for a long time now. Um, and I bought my first Bitcoin mining contract in 2013. And since then, I've been fascinated with the space and, and learning about it ever since. So, let's just get started. There's two things I'll probably be presenting, well, I will be presenting today. Our business play up and the play chip, which is our utility token. So, keep that in mind. Okay, what is PlayUp? PlayUp is a global gaming ecosystem. It exists today. It, it is not a concept. It exists of six brands that each address a unique audience and together create a formidable gaming ecosystem. They, uh, our, our business model is from free to paid. So we do freemium to premium, as they say in the app space where we require users from all over the globe with a low CPA, a cost per acquisition, and transition them into some of our paid products. That's the model. Um, a lot of ICOs, particularly the, the ones you hear bad stories about, like to bury their team way down in the end or don't even put it in there or fill with people the moonlighting. But I think it's important for us to say, to present that we have 27 full-time staff working on this business in Australia alone. Uh, headquartered in Sydney, but spread across our offices in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, sorry, Melbourne and Darwin, uh, where we have a licensed betting um, um, license. Uh, our management team uh, have been in the industry for a while. So as you can see from up there and there, um, they've been managing companies such as Crown Bet, Draft Stars, Betfair, and Fortune 500 companies such as SAP and EY, Ernst & Young. Thank you. All right, where are we today? Do we have traction? Yes, we do. The answer is we have 400,000 users on our platform today across all of those brands that, I, that, I've, that I've mentioned earlier. We are on track to do over 200 million in gross gaming yield or turnover this, this calendar year. Um, we generate over or close to 20 million page impressions per month. And I'll explain why that's important a little bit later. What market where are we in? You've probably guessed it. We're in the online gaming market. It is one of the biggest markets in the world. Uh, it is responsible for generating over 465 US billion dollars in turnover per year in just regulated markets. And as many of you might know, America is not a regulated market yet. And also the size of the industry, including unregulated markets, is up to 3 trillion um, US turnover per year. All right, so what are we doing? What's our problem? What are we trying to solve? When we launched, uh, as you saw in that traction graph earlier, we launched in August last year. We quickly gained country, we launched, sorry, in Australia and India. We quickly gained users from over 70 countries across the globe. Now in our free platform, players in Australia and India could realize the day of their wins. They'd realize, they, sorry, we, they would get points for when they would win. And then, so we just lost audio there. Or is that just me? We're good, so sorry. They get points where they win, but they would have to cash them out through our store. Um, there were 68 participants, 68 uh, participants from 68 countries who were just playing without the ability to realize their win. So we knew we were onto something. It was an entertaining platform, but what if they could actually cash out what they had won? So we needed a global gaming reward and payment system, and we went out to find one. That's what we're doing here today. We are launching our ICO. Uh, we're launching a utility token that is built on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it is named Playchip. It's interesting point to make here is that our business isn't the blockchain. Our business is enhanced by the blockchain. It is something that will allow us to scale and reach other parts of the world that we would never be able to do so before with the current system of banking systems and so on. 
Right, so this is going to start a video. $1 trillion a year sports betting and gambling economy. PlayUp is a fully functioning platform with hundreds of thousands of active players. We are an approved service provider for some of the biggest sporting leagues in the world, and we're just getting started. Our development roadmap will move PlayUp into a fully decentralised international platform, allowing sports fans across the globe to connect, compete and collect at any time. PlayUp is introducing the PlayChip, an ERC20 utility token built on the Ethereum blockchain. The convergence of the blockchain, cryptocurrencies and the PlayUp platform represents the future of sports betting and gambling. When integrated into our existing platform, it will provide three clear and immediate benefits. Firstly, bigger rewards. By opening up the PlayUp platform to the world, we create larger prize pools for sports fans to compete for and win. Secondly, increased trust and transparency will be delivered via the blockchain, providing an unparalleled level of protection. Lastly, a significant portion of play chips will be used exclusively to incentivize players to share and grow the platform, populating the network and ensuring the use and viability of the play chip token. Choose your sport, create your bet, sit back and watch your sporting knowledge turn into real rewards. Sign up and be part of the PlayUp ICO, the future of sports betting and gambling. I'm not sure what next, what slides come out next, so my apologies. All right, so that's highlighted what we're doing. Um, probably the three clear benefits that the blockchain and the Ethereum and, and our play chip will deliver. As you can see up here in this slide, is we will build a um, a crypto enabled wallet. Now that will be capable of accepting deposits in nearly all fiat country uh, currencies and all cryptocurrencies. If you look at a lot of the ICOs, people struggle, even successful ICOs have struggled with some of them with unlimited funds to even build a user base of 10 to 20,000 users of their wallet or their platform. As of day one, we will have 400,000 users that will have a crypto enabled wallet in their account once this is launched on our platform and allows them to frictionlessly transfer, sorry, transition through all of our six um, business units. Um, we are also, um, well one of the reasons why Daniel can't be here today as CEO is we're announcing that two other brands in this space are going to adopt the play chip as their form of cryptocurrency. So it's not just our ecosystem, it's anyone, any business or complementary business in the gaming industry will be able to use it and integrate to it. Uh, um, we're going to run out of time, I'm going to skip this one, but I think the video did a pretty good job of explaining this, but really just to cap off the three biggest users are we get a global audience, we can reach those like we never, uh, that we never could before. With a global, global audience, that brings you much bigger prize pool, which starts to take a life of its own then, and also incentivize users. Our users now feel more like owners, not players, and they actually incentivize to get their friends and their family and so on to join this game and competition. All right, great slide for anyone that's interested in ICOs. Will, why will the play chip increase in value? It's a, it, it's a complex topic, but it really boils down to two simple things, on us anyway. We've got to generate usage. From usage, well actually, we've got, we've got to get players using this, growing it, telling their friends, and actually and, and making this one of the biggest platforms we can. From then, or along that path, the crypto community will take notice. And when the crypto community starts seeing a lot of volume running through exchanges, they start to say they want to get involved. That this is a, this is a quite a simple path, and that's what we're uh, uh, sorry, simple strategy that we're implementing. All right, probably don't have much time to go into two one minute now, too, too too much detail on these. But if I can take your attention to the bottom two rows, um, these are all deemed successful ICOs. And if you look at our visits and our duration, one thing I think I'm hoping to drill down here tonight is that. It is an existing business. It has a lot of users. The users are very sticky. They're staying on the site. The, um, that 11 minutes 22 average visit duration is actually the highest of any sports duration on a website in India. And I can't remember the exact stats in Australia, but it's just showing you, if you look at that in comparison, we're fivefold more than some of our competitors is the, the stickiness. I'll skip through. All right, we are in an ICO. The play chip token sale is on right now. 
friends and family and close contacts, we had close colleagues sold out the seed, the uh, private seed round. We're in a public seed round. Um, we can get the details there. Obviously, don't expect you to remember all those details. My staff are out the front for the rest of the day. There's also a two-pager with further details. More details about the coin economy and the token economy and things like that. Obviously, um, bits of information you would like to see before um, getting involved. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And now I would like to welcome Brett Sampson, CEO and CTO of GT Systems to the stage. Oh, we're on now. Yeah, we're on now. Beautiful. Excellent. Clicker. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much, Alex. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a rock and roll guy, luckily, so I'm going to move around a bit, but I'm a drummer. They don't normally give me a microphone, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to need to move fairly quickly. We're in the private room just outside the doors here where all the cool applications are. Um, okay, so this is what we are. We're, uh, um, we've been in the peer-to-peer -peer business. We started original research back in 2002, so we've been looking at this for quite some time. We developed a system for delivery of premium movies and video across the internet in super premium quality, we solved the spinning wheel of death problem. We did that peer-to-peer. -peer. That system is designed and patented and approved by one of the largest studios in Hollywood with the world's first legal peer-to-peer -peer movie sharing system approved by Hollywood in the world. They absolutely love us. So we're starting out, we're not doing an ICO with, at the moment. We think they create more problems than they solve. We are doing a token, and our token is a reward system for people sharing their disks so that we can move the slices of video around the network and a reward system for sharing movies. The studios only ever ask us one question when we say we're sharing movies. They say, do they have to pay for them? And we say, yes, secured by DRM and our security. They go, great, we love it, because they understand the peer-to-peer -peer thing. Believe it or not, they hate a certain peer-to-peer -peer thing, but they love peer-to-peer -peer things that are secure and people have to pay. Um, so that is, and, and the two things are completely separate. Our peer-to-peer -peer distribution system is locked and approved. We've been through a big approval process. We're not changing that. We're using the token as a crypto, sorry, as a frequent reward, frequent share or reward system, and therefore, under the legislation, we've talked to some lawyers, we were at a blockchain law conference a couple of weeks ago, where a, a frequent share -er scheme like the frequent flyer schemes, and under the current regulation, they are exempt. Okay, let's get into it. We think there are some opportunities coming on uh, going forward. This is our vision. It's a pretty big vision, uh, but we think it's very achievable, particularly with the blockchain community, which we absolutely love. I mean, you, you, you guys are my folks. So thank you for, for existing. Um, let's look at how big that vision is. Okay, so the movie business globally, $100 billion. The game business, $100 billion. That's $200 billion. Uh, VR, in Australia alone, they're a billion each. All right, VR is going to be Another 200, was it 100 billion by 2021, and IoT even bigger than that. So I'm sorry for the gaming guys, but the market's actually bigger than, th than that. Um, and if you look down the bottom, you'll see this what people are doing at the moment. So iTunes is 4 billion. Um, Steam, which is the largest gaming platform in the world, pretty much owns the gaming business. They're 3 billion. Netflix is 11 billion, 11 and a bit. So if you look at that, you know, they. They, no one has a really big share of the market at the moment, so we think this is very achievable. So what, uh, what problem are we solving? So the first, as I said, we solve the problem. Hands up the people in the room who watch streaming and have seen this little spinning wheel of death thing. Like, it should be everyone in the room who watches streaming, certainly in my case. Um, we solve that problem. With our technology, there is zero spinning wheel of death, zero fuzziness. We call this, everyone uses a technology called adaptive bitrate. We call that adaptive bitrate stealing your money. You are not getting HD. You're probably getting worse than SD in a lot of cases. 85%, so Netflix. On Netflix's website, you need 25 megabits per second to stream 4K, which is the new standard. You can see it. We're, we're showing the app and 4K video in the, you know, on our stand. 85% of the world, roughly, cannot see that right now. They can with our technology. 
55% of the world cannot see HD. I'll say that again. 55% of the world cannot stream HD. We solve both those problems. Oh, sorry, and we also save people a lot of money. We're rolling this out ourselves. We're going to save ourselves a lot of money. We're the, we're the lowest cost provider in the market. This is huge. I've talked about this already. The studios hate a certain peer-to-peer -peer protocol. We spend most of our time convincing them that we are not that peer-to-peer -peer protocol. I won't even say its name when I'm talking to the studios. I call it the other protocol. I'm sure you know, all know what I'm talking about. Um, so our system is secure. Uh, and basically, we're going to stop what happened with HD, which is um, getting out into every one of those peer-to-peer -peer systems in the world. The studios do not want that to happen to 4K. And the hurdles we jump through are way higher for 4K than HD. So this is huge. This is a massive debate in the US, right? This is Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, versus Comcast and Verizon. And they're all pointing at each other saying, who's going to pay for this? Right? The telco engineers call this threading an elephant through the eye of a needle, trying to get video across the internet on the traditional models. So we solve this problem. This stops being a debate. We go back to the original design of the internet. Problem solved. So the beautiful thing, I love it. I'm a systems engineer. I love the systems engineer guy. We'll do a little club later. Um, this is a, a guy who in 1959 started researching this in the early 1960s, I think about 1962, published a paper on this. Uh, these are, this is every architecture in the history of, in, of networking, a wide, wide area networking, I should say. If you copied the right-hand one, which is the original in internet, peer-to-peer, -peer, ARPANET, and then DARPANET, defense got involved pretty quickly when they worked out, hey, this thing's unstoppable. We like this if we're defense guys. This is what scares nation states about the blockchain. It is unstoppable. You copy that right-hand picture to the left, you would have a history of the internet. Started out peer-to-peer, -peer, then it was centralized. So the centralized, that horrible looking one there with the big server in the middle is everybody. It's Facebook, it's Google, it's Twitter, it's, and they have broken the internet. Right? Then people tried to solve it, they distributed it out into exchanges, Akamai do this, Netflix do this. Kind of half solves the problem, doesn't really work. What's the, what's the solution? Well, guess what? Let's go back to the, the original design of the internet, do it peer-to-peer. -peer. And then we said, well, okay, mm, that sort of half works. The first one half works, the last one half works. What if we smashed them together and made it secure? Boom, that's our patent. We think that is the most efficient way to distribute video over the internet. A combination of peer-to-peer -peer and top-down CDN made secure and acceptable to the studios. Global patent registering and going through the process now in the US, Japan, China, Australia, and Europe. It does movies, games, VR, because we originally started doing games when nobody else was thinking about doing games, and it basically does everything. We got it actually running out in the back corner of the, the private room up the back here. It's not private, but you know what I mean. Um, so this is interesting. So once again, We've been working on this stuff, like I said, we started doing research with Syrah and then with Nikta back 2002, then 2007. And then Charlie, somewhere in the room, who was the head of home entertainment uh, at Big W, we did, had a previous technology called Manufacture on Demand. We were burning CDs and DVDs in retail stores. Charlie said, I want to do online, I want to do movies, games and music. I want to do it yesterday and I got no money. And I said, Charlie, don't go anywhere. I thought I needed a couple of months. Five years later, here we are. But most challenging but most rewarding thing we've ever done. It turns out there was a guy in America doing this. He was working on the other half of the problem. So we created a system and we wrote a spec for what we needed when we filed the patent in 2014. And it said we need four things. We need a, a file system, we need a, a, direct, uh, into a directory structure, we need a protocol stack and we need some, we call it movie share points. We've been talking about movie share points from day one. Right. What's so this guy, Juan Bennett, who's my hero, you've got to love a guy who wears his network design and philosophy on his T-shirt. Um, if we'd given him that spec and said, build what we need, he could not have done a better job. This guy is the most heavily backed network guy in the world right now. So he went through white combinators, which everyone knows, the number one accelerator in the world. Union Square Ventures found him. He was a huge hit there. There's a fantastic video. The best video for him is to watch the white combinator Juan Bennett video. Goes for an hour and a half, it explains everything. Um, Union Square Ventures found him. Union Square Ventures are the number one venture capital in the world. They funded every unicorn in the last 10 years. They realized, oops, we broke the goose. We almost broke the goose that lays the golden eggs. We better fix this. They find one Bennett and they go, 
have 50 million bucks, knock yourself out. We love what you're doing. There's a video of the managing partner of Union Square Ventures saying that. There's a blog on their website saying exactly that. So then one goes, okay, well, if we built the interplanetary file system, this is the level that one thinks on. If it works on Mars, it'll work in Sydney and New York. He said, okay, if we're going to do that, then we need some sort of incentive. And then he looks at the crypto and he goes, hmm, crypto's pretty cool. And then being one, he goes, yeah, but some of them are pretty crap. So he invents his own called Filecoin. Probably most of you in the room would know towards the end of last year, the Filecoin ICO raised $200 million. 2,000, sorry, yes, 2,000 of Union Square Ventures, Andreessen Horowitz shoot. And their closest friends gave them $200,000. This is how it all fits together. It fits perfectly. It doesn't break our security model. We don't have to change anything with the studios. That's the team. That's what happen What happens when you have that. That's the most amazing team in the world. I won't go into the detail, but yeah, like everybody else, we're not hiding. The guy who said before, we're not hiding them. These are the sorts of things that happen when you get that team and you do what we're doing. So we got the first quote there from the studio is Alicia McCauley, who was head of digital at Fox. She said, Rhett, the peer word scares us, but we're coming with you. That was five years ago when we first showed it to her. A couple of years later, the second quote there is the lady, global head of digital for Disney in Burbank. And she said, you do this in Australia, we will support you. And the rest is, the biggest hurdle is getting people to look at them. So I'll go through here. This is our value prop. This is it. Binge on the best quality catalog in the world and the best viewing experience in the world. Even when you're asleep, you get crypto. Watch movies, have fun. Share some files, make some coin, fix the internet, do some good. As I said, we won this a couple of weeks ago. We're a bit consensus in May. We're in the back corner of the room. Um, we're looking for 500000 to do a beta. And talk to us. We're in the back corner, and I'll leave you with a little video. Thank you, Rhett. And just to remind everyone that Blast and GT Systems stand will be directly outside the door in the room at the back. And now I'd like to welcome William Wong and Grace Wong, co-founders of Livin, to the stage. Good morning. How's everyone doing? This is uh, it's not 3 p.m. yet, so I, I imagine everyone is at, at their peak intelligence level. So hopefully I will make this uh, as exciting as crypto can be. So my name is William, uh, CEO and co-founder of Liven. We are building a cryptocurrency for the mainstream, for you and me, on the existing payment network. So there are 2,000 cryptocurrencies out there right now. Probably 5,000 more coming this year. So you ask yourself, how many of those coins right now is actually is in use at the restaurants or at the, at the grocery stores? How many? 2,000 venues, 1,000 venues, not even 100. So why is it that um, the cryptocurrency is so not adopted? So it's the why is it, what's stopping this mainstream adoption of this amazing cryptocurrency technology? I said the main problem is that, as you all know, it is not a currency. It is not a currency at all. Um, it is not a reliable medium of exchange. When merchants realize that whatever they're accepting fluctuate by 10, 7 to 
every day, no one's going to accept that. If no one accepts that, no one's going to use it. It's a um, vicious loop. And that's why you know, there has not been any payment platform that has tackled this problem head on. Most of the um, uh, problems is not just about technology, it's also about implementation. You cannot go to a local pizzeria and say, hey, use um, such and such token. They'll show you the door. Uh, yeah, I'm sure some of you have seen this video called Bitcoin Explained, that they want to uh, get chicken as payment. You know, this is repeating right now. But that doesn't mean that there's no, there's no hope, there is. The answer is not creating any more sophisticated protocols or tokens or coins. So some of you may have heard this new, new genre of currencies called stable coins, um, you know, true USD, DAI, Nomin, and base coin. Now these coins are stable, but then great in theory, but can you use it? Can you buy lunch with it tomorrow? You can't, because to actually make a currency usable, you, you need, making currency is actually pretty easy. You can do it in, in two hours in a taxi. What you cannot do in two hours is actually building the foundation, the ecosystem. You cannot do this in an overnight. So the secret to actually approaching this cryptocurrency for the mainstream is to understand the basic building blocks of the cryptocurrency or the currency itself and then build an ecosystem around it in which you can now, the currency can actually grow and be adopted by the mainstream. So what we want to do, we're an existing company. We talked about a lot about existing companies entering into blockchain space. Existing company, we already have a payment network. We've got 39, 39 people working for the company and we want to be the first company to create or bring this cryptocurrency for everyday use, for everyday people. And that starts with creating a amazing platform and ecosystem. So to explain what we are, I'm gonna hand the mic to uh, Grace, my co-founder and assistant. Hi everyone. Oh, it's too high for me. <laughs> um, so uh, my brother was talking about the Liban platform. So four years ago, William and I created a reward-based mobile payment platform where basically you guys can go and pay for your meal using a mobile digital wallet. Um, so what that means is you eat and then you earn money. <laughs> and so that's how it works basically. So you go and download our app right now. If you like what I, what, what I say, then please download the app live and right now. And you can find places to eat and then you can pay for your meal like the way you pay for your Uber ride. Just one click a button is all you need and then you can walk out. And what that means is then you will earn money which you can buy more food or share with your friends or give it to charity. And that's the basically our live and ecosystem, which is so viral because it's all built up on a pay forward movement where people go to restaurants and to eat and they earn money and then that money gets to be spent back into the system, either that or go to charities. And in which case, charity organizations uh, encourage users to keep using the app more and more. So how, how have we gone so far? Progress-wise, we have 200,000 people using our awesome app Liven right now. And there's 1,000 restaurants joined up. And there's 2,000 more restaurants are coming on board, contracted to come on board in the next four or five months. And then there we have processed almost $5 million in transactions already. And the market opportunity here is trend, uh, it's so huge. It's only food, um, food and beverage market, but it's 3.5 trillion. So that's, we haven't even scratched the surface. And, so what's it? 
Judges question many times. Go back. Now there is a partner section then. Okay, so there, there was actually examples of all the partners we had. Um, basically, like a nene chicken, papa rich, and sumo salad. So if any one of you feels like you need to lose some weight, then go today at, and then pay using Liven and then eat salad and then earn money, and then try out our app. It's really good. So, and now I'm going to pass it on to William again because we are now talking about Live and Coin, which is our new feature, and which is the game changer of well, why we are here for. Thank you, Grace. Um, now, that explains our platform. So, what the next challenge that we are going to tackle is building a purpose-built cryptocurrency that you can use right away. That's the, the fundamental difference between many of the ICOs that are promising the world. You know, 20-something-year-olds coming from Ivy League schools and say, hey, we're going to change the entire financial world. Come on. The 99% of the world is run by fiat system. 50% is still done by cash. Are you kidding? How can you ignore all that and you being 1% trying to create this massive you know, financial system just like that. You need to approach, understand how blockchain works and, how, and, and make sure that it works with the current system. So the ca use case for blockchain for us is quite clear. Liveon is a global company. It is now in Australia, in two cities. However, the nature of global uh, expansion, the, to, to expand globally, you, the fungibility of the cryptocurrency, cross-border transactions much better than ACH. It's faster, it's more secure. It al allows us to expand to other cities very quickly. Also, Grace touched on how you can split bills. You can actually send your token to your friend um, easily within a mobile wallet. Someone touched on before that hardly any existing successful cryptocurrency wallet uh, has you know, hardly 20,000 followings. For us, on day one, it's going to be 200,000 people. So now this is blockchain conference after all. So I'm going to have to touch a uh, touch little bit on the, uh, the actual mechanics of the tokens. So this is simply a limited supply of tokens that works to reward the customers as they spend, as they use the network. The more people use the app, the more tokens are released in circulation, the more tokens are released, the purchasing power of the token, just like Bitcoin, which halves every certain period. The token's getting smaller and smaller, and therefore the purchasing power, power each token goes up. Over here, an example, 65%. On 65% of the tokens being released into circulation, that's the launch of ICO, each token is worth 3.9 cents. When 70% of token is released, which requires a lot of people using the app, maybe we need to be in a couple of cities, the token exchange internal price is $8.78. Now, if you want to take a quick screenshot of that, please do so. But what this illustrates, this is simply illustrations of how the token exchange rate is governed. As you can see, when first user spends $100, that person gets $20 worth of reward in live and token. But because the token pool is limited, it gets depleted proportionately. In the first instance, 1% of 2,000 tokens is 20. Therefore, implied exchange rate is $1 to one live token. Next, the pool gets smaller. Therefore, the 1% of the pool, it gets smaller and smaller, while the reward amount stays the same. So therefore, the, the exchange rate varies as more and more people use. Next thing that is quite important is dual market effect. Now, we're not silly to not know that there is hundreds of exchange market out there. there, there, there one, once these tokens are in circulation, people are going to trade them on the exchanges. Let's take two examples here. First, Liven token internally is $1. It's being traded at $5. I don't know why, but let's say it is $5 at exchange. Savvy users, 
200,000, 200,000 of our savvy users right now will know that you can actually acquire this one lifetime token by going to Sumo Salad, buy one salad, you're going to get one lifetime token, and you go to a good exchange and sell it for $5. Your Sumo Salad is free. This puts an upward pressure in the internal price. More people use the app, the internal price gradually goes up. More people sell their lifetime token on the exchange, the price of the exchange comes down. But that will quickly correct itself and the virtuous loop gets started. The second scenario where let's say the, the exchange price is now 20 cents when internal price $1. Same scenario happens. The people outside will start buying the token at 20 cents, rush into the app and use it for $1. Consume the food for $1. What this means is that it puts an upward pressure in the external market and increases the app usage even further, which means either way, no matter how you look at it, the app usage, the network effect, the demand for this token goes up constantly. Now the team, two of us, there are two more and 35 more. We are not just some graduates who, who is building a business on the back of white paper. We have built the business. We have executed. We have raised $11.5 million in venture funding. We have created one of the top best restaurant mobile app in the country. And we have the resources. And with the support of our several thousand merchants, we can create the cryptocurrency for the mainstream, which is the holy grail of cryptocurrency that everyone has been waiting for 10 years. Our platform launches on October and our Public sale starts in June. The whitelist registration is open now. If you're interested, please go to our website, LiveInPay.io, or you can talk to one of us at our desk over there. Thank you. Thank you, William and Grace. That concludes the first session. I'd like to invite you to join us for refreshments and to network with the presenters. Just to remind you that there will be stands in the main room and also in the room directly outside. We will resume at 10.55.